look familiar? Since the 7th century in China, people have been using fireworks in festivals and celebrations. Have you ever wondered how different fireworks give off different colors? Or why some fireworks seem to explode right away while others take a while? Fireworks are a great example of chemistry in action. So to answer these questions, it'll help to understand the structure of the atom. I know it might not sound so exciting right now, but this is chemistry knowledge that you'll be able to use to predict characteristics of many everyday substances, such as calcium and carbon. So let's get started. Welcome to Chemistry Matters. In this unit, we're going to focus on different models of the atom and their connection to the periodic table. As you know from the science and engineering practices, a model is a physical, conceptual, or mathematical representation of a real phenomenon whose purpose is to explain and predict the observed phenomenon. Scientists use observations and data from experiments to develop models and models can change over time with new information. So let's visit our classroom to learn about models of the atom. We're gonna start by looking at the first model of the atom. And believe it or not, this marble represents this model. Picture it's smaller than even a grain of sand. What can you tell me about it? As a model of an atom, of course. It's circular. It's a solid. Good, so this model's a sphere and it's solid. This model of the atom was proposed by John Dalton. Dalton was a scientist working in the early 19th century who based his model off the work of the Greek philosopher Democritus. Democritus coined the term atomos, which means uncuttable. Democritus' model of the atom lasted for hundreds of years before scientists started to consider alternate ideas. One of those scientists was John Dalton. Dalton believed that atoms were tiny spheres that could not be cut into anything smaller. He thought all atoms of a particular element were identical, and that these atoms could be combined in specific ratios to form new substances. Many of his ideas are found in our current model of the atom, but not all of them. Now let's take a look at the next model of the atom. How does this model look different or similar to the Dalton model? It's still a circle, but it's different because it has negative charges spread throughout it. Right. It's still a solid. Good, so this is J.J. Thompson's model of the atom. It's still spherical, but instead of being completely solid, it's now made up of different parts known as subatomic particles because they're inside the atom. In the early 1900s, physicist J.J. Thompson was experimenting with a cathode ray tube and discovered the electron. The electron is a negatively charged particle in an atom. This discovery led to the plum pudding model of the atom. Of course, most of us have never seen a plum pudding, so I like to call it the chocolate chip cookie model, or the mint chocolate chip cookie model, as in this case. <laughs> Thompson's model included positive and negative charges. Throughout his experiments, Thompson found that the negative charges take up less space than the positive charges. The negative charges spread throughout the positive area, like the mint chocolate chips in this cookie, or like the plums in the plum pudding model. As you can see, our students are looking at different models of the atom to determine how they've changed over time. As science and technology advance, it becomes easier for us to study the substances around us. These students have looked at models through the early 1900s, but a lot has changed since then. Scientists will keep using a model as long as the model explains their observations. As technology and tools improve, sometimes models break down and have to be revised. That's what science is like. We keep using the best explanation until that explanation doesn't work anymore. Then we have to come up with a better explanation or model of our observations. Now let's get back to our classroom to see how the atomic model kept changing. We've explored the first two models of the atom, but as with most science, improvements to the model continue to happen as new information is available. Around the same time that Thompson was working, another model hit the scene. Look at this model. How is it different from Thompson's model? It has rings that go around it. Yeah, but there's something in the middle of it. It still has positive and negative charges, though. Right. This is called the solar system model because the electrons orbit the positive charge area in the center, like planets going around the sun. The positively charged area is known as the nucleus. 
Ernest Rutherford developed an experiment where he shot small, positively charged particles at a very thin piece of gold, which is made up of lots of gold atoms. Remember, at the time, Thompson's model was the accepted model of the atom. Thinking about the Thompson model, what would Rutherford have expected to happen when he shot the particles at the gold foil? Well, he probably expected them all to bounce back. Wait, why would they all bounce back? That's a good question. What is it in the model that makes the particles seem to bounce back? Well, the model's made up of all positive charges, so I think that those positive charges would make the particles bounce back. That's an interesting hypothesis. Rutherford expected the particles to go straight through the gold atoms and only bounce back if they hit the negative charges that were spread throughout Thompson's model. What really happened was that the many of the particles went straight through the foil, while others bounced back or off at different angles. Remember that the foil was made up of tons of atoms of gold, so the particles were also going through the atoms themselves. So now why did the particles bounce off? They hit something. Okay, what did they hit? The nucleus. Good. Rutherford thought that the particles must be hitting something with enough mass to cause the particles to deflect or bounce off. Rutherford called this mass the nucleus. The particles that passed straight through the foil must have moved through empty space between the nucleus and the electrons. I'm gonna give you guys all models. Just like real atoms, you can't see inside it very well, or at all. I put one marble inside each box. You can roll around the inside if you tilt it. Tilt the model and let the marble inside roll around. Use your observations to determine what's on the inside of the box. This one seems to have something right in the middle. This one seems like it has a bunch of objects stuck all over the inside of the box. Right. Even though you can't see what's on the inside of the box, you can still use observations to figure out what the atoms must be like. The marble rolling around represents the particles hitting the atom in Rutherford's experiment. Because of the way they strike the objects in the box, you can tell what the inside of the box must be like. Since Rutherford knew from Thompson that the electron had very little mass and a negative charge, Rutherford determined that the nucleus must be positively charged and have a lot of mass. Eventually, the positively charged particle in the nucleus became known as a proton. Later on, James Chadwick discovered another particle within the nucleus called the neutron. Neutrons have mass similar to the protons, but have no charge. Neutrons will become important for us later on. Now let's look at the next model. This is the Bohr model. How is this model different from Rutherford's? Well, it has circles instead of orbits. It has a nucleus in the middle. Good. You notice that the Bohr model is very similar to the Rutherford model, except in the Bohr model, some of the electrons are closer to the nucleus than others. These electrons are found in the circles you mentioned. These circles represent specific energy levels. Bohr used mathematics to study light, gases, and energy. He found that electrons move within specific energy levels, each of which requires different amounts of energy. This set amount of energy is known as a quantum. The different color of fireworks are one way to demonstrate these quantum energy levels. We'll investigate quantum energy levels later, and although newer models of the atom do exist, we'll continue to use this Bohr model because it's most useful for this course. Now we know how the model of the atom came about, and you've seen the Bohr model, which you'll continue to use throughout this course. Remember, a model can be a concept, or a thinking tool, or an equation, or a physical model like these. Even something as simple as this cardboard box can be a useful model of what's inside of an atom. I love how scientific ideas change over time as we have more technology and information. From here, we can investigate the different parts of the atom, like protons, neutrons, and electrons. We'll use the information about these subatomic particles to figure out exactly what it is that makes those fireworks explode in such vivid colors. Join us as we continue our investigation of atomic structure in our next video.